Some of you may remember a movie back in 1987. Uh, the main uh, star of the show was Michael Douglas. The movie was called Wall Street. Kind of gave you the, an inside look and to the stock market and how, uh, how that's all done. And there's a point in the movie where Gordon Gecko, who is the character that Michael Douglas portrayed, he was a corporate raider. And he's speaking to a group of shareholders, and he starts out with this statement, greed is good. And I'm sure that he made that statement to get the very reaction I saw from a number of you. What? What did you just say? Greed is good? And then he went on to explain what he meant. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save this company, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the United States of America. And, of course, in the movie, it goes on to show that uh, this character, Gordon Gecko, had a young protege who was trying to emulate him and learn from him, and in doing so, adopted some of the rather unscrupulous ways of his uh, mentor and ended up paying the price for it in the end. Now, we might say, well, that, that's just movie, that's just fiction. We don't really have to pay much attention to it. But from the perspective of capitalism, greed is good. I had an economics professor once say that if everyone in America suddenly became content with what they had, the American economy would grind to a halt. It's that consuming desire to have more, to have bigger, to have better, to have newer, that drives the economy forward, that makes the demand for new items, for better items, for bigger items, for more expensive items, to be manufactured and sold, and that's what turns the wheels of the American economy. Now, that may work in an economics class. That might work on Wall Street. That is not what the Bible has to say. The Bible has a very different perspective on greed. Greed is not good. In fact, in our study of the Scripture tonight, we will see that greed is the root of all kinds of evil, even in the church. I want to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We see the root of gospel corruption in verses 3 through 5. Paul writes to Timothy, If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree with the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth, and catch this, who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Here is the root of of gospel corruption. He's talking here about false teachers. Now, he's not just talking about false teachers outside. He's talking about false teachers in the church. Apparently, at this time when Paul wrote 
this letter to Timothy. Uh, Timothy was ministering in the city of Ephesus, uh, one of the more successful churches in the, that time. Uh, most people would think of Ephesus as a, a great church. You know, think about its history. The Apostle Paul founded the church, uh, and, and it grew. Uh, he was in Ephesus longer than he was anywhere else. He spent three years in establishing the church at Ephesus. Uh, later on, Timothy would be one of its pastors. Uh, even after Timothy was gone, the apostle John settled in Ephesus and was uh, the overseer of that particular congregation. So they had the, the greatest <laughs> names as far as their leaders were concerned, and yet... They were plagued with people from the inside who were leading folks astray. And Paul had to warn Timothy about these false teachers. He, he kind of gives, gives us a most wanted poster. <laughs> Timothy, these are the guys I want you to be on the lookout for because they're preaching false doctrine. And he gets to the very root of what they're talking about why they're doing what they're doing, not just what they're talking. He, he doesn't get into so much the content of the false teaching, but he does give us the motivation, which we're going to see in this passage. Paul evaluates the false teachers in relation to questions of truth, unity, and motivation. His criticism of them is that they stray from the faith they split the church, and they love money. In short, they are deviating, they are divisive, and they are desirous. And you can see this throughout the years, even today. Many of the false teachers who claim to be preaching the gospel of Christ but aren't, you'll see these characteristics within them. Now, in this text, Paul strongly condemned anyone who taught something contrary to this orthodox teaching of Christ. <laughs> the Greek word that Paul uses here, and I'm probably going to butcher it, heterodidaskaleo. <laughs> heterodidaskaleo, yeah, okay. It's a compound word. Heteros means different something foreign. It's another, not the same. And didasco means to teach. So he's saying these, these false preachers are coming in. They are teaching a different message. They have a different gospel. Paul had taken the Galatians to task. And in Galatians chapter 1, he says, I am astonished that you would so quickly go after a different gospel, a different message than the one you first heard from me. And then he put in no uncertain terms, if anyone's preaching a gospel other than the one I'm preaching about Jesus Christ, let him be eternally accursed. This is not something uh, to, to mess with. Now, let me be very clear. We're not talking about someone who differs from the pastor in a non-essential matter of doctrine, all right? There are areas of our Christian faith where we can agree to disagree, and that's healthy, that's good, that's fine, all right? One of the ones that jumps out in my mind the most is our view of the end times. There are a lot of different possibilities that have been put out there about how things may work out at the end of time using the scripture and and i have read very very godly scholars and students of the word and and pastors and teachers who can give very strong biblical support to their view of how things are going to shape up at the end of time 
and they don't all agree. <laughs> Some believe that Jesus will come before a period of great tribulation on the earth. Some believe he'll come after. Some believe he'll come somewhere in the middle. Some don't believe in any of it at all, that it's not to be taken literally, but it means figuratively. And again, I don't question their faith. I don't question their, their trust in the scripture. If it's a way they interpret it. And I have my, I have my view. I may not be right. As I study the scripture, this is how I see it, but I'm not going to condemn someone who has a different view than me of an area of scripture when we are all agreeing that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, the Bible is the Word of God, and only through faith in Christ are we saved by the grace of God. When we agree on those things, we're free to have some different views on other things. You get into matters of predestination and free will. You get into matters of what version of the Bible are we going to use. And we can agree to disagree. That's fine. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul is talking about people who are leading people away from Christ. Away from a salvation by grace through faith. All right? That's what Paul is talking about here. I like J.B. Phillips' rendering. He says, some doctrinal novelty. They'll come up with some new thing. In fact, you'll, you'll notice a lot of these false teachers will say, I've received a new revelation from God. We don't need a new revelation because we've got the revelation right here. Okay? This is our revelation. This is what we base our belief Right here. And so if someone comes along and says, oh, God's given me a new revelation. Whew, the red flags ought to be going up big time. And that is what Paul is talking about here. Now, he mentions in verse 3, if anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, that's the way the NIV renders it. Not sure that that's the best way of rendering the original language. Um, the, the word that is used here is literally the truth that leads to godliness. All right. So it isn't just godly teaching. It isn't just teaching about God. It is teaching that is going to lead to a godly way of living. Because the true Christian faith is not only about what we believe, it's also about how we behave. And if what we believe doesn't change how we behave, what we believe ain't right. That's what Paul is getting at here. It's the truth, so it's biblically sound, but it's going to change the way you live. And if it doesn't change the way you live, you really don't believe it. You know, you can state it all you want. I think it was A.W. Tozer that used to say, I don't care what you believe, I want to know what you really believe. <laughs> and what he meant by that was, what you really believe is going to affect the way you behave. And if it doesn't, it ain't real. And so when Paul says, the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to godliness. Jesus didn't come just to fill our heads with information. He came to change our lives. And that is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes from God. It's, it's godly in its origin. But it's also very practical. It promotes a godly life. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah's first test of a teacher, in Isaiah 8.20, it says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light. So if you want to know, if you hear a preacher on television or on the radio, or maybe you visit another church, you know, I'm 
not sure this is quite matching up. This is your standard. You need to be a Berean Christian. <laughs> that when Paul came along and preached, he said they, they searched the scriptures every day to make sure what Paul was saying was right. That's what we need to make sure that it lines up with the truth. The church must keep the pattern of sound teaching. Paul wrote that in 2 Timothy 1.13. It's the idea of being healthy. Tony Evans writes, Godliness is a lifestyle that consistently pursues and reflects the character of God. It's a way of life. It's the way you should roll. I like that. Only Tony Evans could get away with that. All of God's people are called to godliness. You know, this idea that you've got, you know, kind of everyday believers, you know, you got the saints and then you have the super saints. <laughs> you know, the, you know, those are your pastors and your missionaries and your teachers. It's garbage. We are all called to follow Christ. That's what a Christian is. And, and there's not levels within there. Now, some may be further on the path than others, but we're all on the same path. And we're all called to the same standard, and that standard is a godly life. And that's what the true message of Christ is going to bring about. Now, as for the false teachers, Paul doesn't mince words when he describes those who did not submit to the authority of Scripture. He, he mentions here three negative characteristics of their influence. First, he says, those who reject the Scripture are conceited. It's the same term Paul used of a new convert who's given authority too quickly back in chapter 3 of the same letter. Remember he said, don't uh, ordain uh, one who is, who's young in the faith, you know, who, who hasn't matured yet. Why? Because he can become conceited. He called it the sin of the devil. And we know that Lucifer became proud and that's when he tried to overthrow God. So these are conceited. It describes someone whose lofty view of himself and his own ideas towers above everything and everyone else. They, they, they like to hear the sound of their own voice. Warren Wiersbe writes, a believer who understands the word will have a burning heart, not a big head. <laughs> And that conceited attitude will cause the teacher to argue about minor things. Paul talks about he has an unhealthy interest in words. Uh, elsewhere, he talks about those who, who like to pick apart genealogies. That was one of the things they do with the Old Testament scriptures. Yeah, there are plenty of them to work with. You know, so they try to find some mysterious spiritual meaning you know, in making stuff up, basically. Paul said, yeah, watch out for that. They're someone who, who's more interested in promoting themselves than they are proclaiming Christ. Second, despite the heretic's lofty view of himself, he understands nothing. You, you can translate the original Greek here to say he's a know-nothing. Back in the 1800s, there was actually a political party that was called the Know-Nothing Party. I think right now you could apply that to both of them, but we won't go too far there. <clears throat> But these teachers are not only misguided, they're actually ignorant. They really don't know what they're talking about. And it's amazing when you look at many even modern false teachers at the level of basic ignorance of Scripture that many of them have. R.C. Sproul wrote about them. What seems to be happening here, and he's talking about a group of TV preachers who were promoting this kind of health and wealth prosperity gospel. What seems to be happening here is not a willful informed attack on Orthodox Christianity. The heresies of the TV preachers seem to follow more from ignorance than from malice. Very little evidence of any significant knowledge of either church history or theology is displayed by them. These men are not scholars. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Not all Christian ministers are called to be technical theologians. 
There are other godly vocations to be pursued other than scholarly ones. What is alarming, however, is the attitude with which these so-called teachers assert their novelties, claiming divine authority for charting a new course. Some of them have been approached charitably and privately by theologians warning of these heresies, but to no avail. And some of these guys are names you would recognize. Some are still on the airwaves. Some of them maybe have passed on or, or are no longer active. But these are, these are individuals that had huge following or still do. But they basically make stuff up off the top of their heads. You know, one of them tried to preach that there are nine persons to the Godhead because there's three persons to the Father, three persons to the Son, and three persons to the Holy Spirit. Where do you get that? You know, one of the very popular views that you hear a lot of is that we are little gods. And because we are little gods, we have the power to create with our words. And, and just, you know, on and on and on. And there's, there's no scripture. It's ignorance. But they come across so well. They're such good communicators that they're able to convince people that they, in fact, do know what they're talking about. Paul says, be careful. These false teachers are really ignorant. So you put these first two together. Paul says he's conceited and understands nothing. J.B. Phillips, in his paraphrase, calls them a conceited idiot. <clears throat> or a pompous ignoramus <laughs> from the Revised English Bible. And yeah, okay, this is strong language, but understand this is a serious offense. Because not only is that person deceived, not only are they not believing right, nor are they behaving right, but they're leading others astray as well. And that's why it's so dangerous. And then third, Paul, he uses the Greek to highlight the irony of a conceited know-nothing, trying to unravel the mysteries of, of theology and philosophy. He talks about these controversial questions. Uh, it really, in the original language, talks about a philosophical investigation, and it's something for which the city of Ephesus had become renowned. They were known as a place where pe these philosophers would gather, and they would debate, and they would toss ideas around. Disputes about words comes from a rare compound word, literally meaning word fight. Okay, We've all heard of a fist fight. We've probably all heard of a food fight. This is a word fight where people are literally fighting each other using words. Now, that's not a bad thing because, you know, it's usually less violent than other terms of fighting. But it becomes a fight. It becomes contentious. And that's why it can cause splits. That's why it can cause divisions within the church. Because they are literally fighting one another with their words. And it's no laughing matter. These false teachers are divisive. Uh, again, quoting from the Revised English Bible, they have a morbid enthusiasm for mere speculations and quibbles. <laughs> You'll take something that is rather obscure and you'll blow it up into something big. You may try to make a whole doctrine based on one phrase or one verse or one idea. Um, you know, one church has done this with a question that Paul asks in 1 Corinthians. You know, if there's no resurrection, why are you baptized for the dead? And they've taken that one little phrase and built a whole practice in theology around being baptized for dead people. Paul wasn't advocating baptism of the dead. He was talking about something that was done at the time. And he's saying, if you really don't believe in resurrection, why are you bothering to do that? That fits into what he's talking about here. Taking some obscure concept and making it bigger than it is. Making it something it's not. We've got to be careful that we don't take things out of context and create something that isn't really there. And it's noteworthy that Paul portrays this person literally as sick. 
Earlier he talked about sound teaching, and the word there could also be translated healthy. It promotes good spiritual health. This is like a disease. It's, it's sickness in the body, and it actually can take away the spiritual health of an individual or of the larger group as a church. Now, the issues at the core of these kinds of frictions have changed through the years, but one thing hasn't, and that's what Paul gets to at the end of verse 5. He talks about the motivation behind it, and it's all about the money. It's all about the almighty dollar. He says that they think that godliness is a means to financial gain. And oh my goodness, if you want a living, breathing example of this today, turn on not all, but quite a few of the TV preachers that spend most of their time talking about, send me your money, give me your money. Um, you send me money and God will bless you. you know, all of that stuff. That's not promoting godliness. That's promoting greed. Their greed. You, know, you send me your money so that I can have a mansion to live in and private jets and this, that, and the other thing. All that is is greed. And Paul points to that as the motivation behind these false teachings. Their motivation for ministry was money. And it's really not even true ministry. It's, it's a religious business. It's all about the bottom line. They're, they're looking at how much are they bringing in so that they can have what they want. You know, how quickly and credibility just goes right out the window when Christian leaders are found to have financial motives. And it, it, it's almost become a stereotype where, you know, you'll hear unbelievers joke, oh, I hear someone's a minister, I always check for my wallet, you know, make sure it's still there. Um, and unfortunately, these false teachers have cast a pale over the true teachers of the word, so that everybody is, is suspected now. Everybody is thought to have had a hidden agenda, you know, ulterior motives for their ministry because they want to get for themselves. And unfortunately for the false teachers, that is the case. Ministers motivated by money leave a bad taste in the mouths of so many unbelievers that it not only turns them away from church, but it'll turn them away from Christ. And that's really where the danger comes in. And that's why Paul is so adamant in his warnings to the church against false teachers that can worm their way into the body. Now, in contrast to the greed of the false teachers, Paul shows the route of godly contentment in verses 6 through 8. This, this is such a great passage of Scripture. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. The very notion that godliness could be a means to gain sounds preposterous. Really what Paul does is not undermine it or contradict it, but confirms it. He says godliness leads to great gain. It's just not financial gain. It's a much better, a much uh, more enduring gain than those things that can quickly fade away. He even uses great gain, providing that you have contentment. Contentment is, is it's such a, an important concept. It, it it could almost be the tenth fruit of the Spirit. You know? I mean, it, it, Paul really talks a lot about contentment and how important that is. Again, the Revised English Bible expresses 
how Paul does this very well. He says, they think religion should yield dividends. And of course, it does yield high dividends, but only to those who are content with what they have. It's the kind of gain that they have wrong. Now, what do we mean by contentment? The word is defined as feeling or showing satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situation. It's where you're okay with what you've got. It's the opposite of that great hit by the Rolling Stones. You know, I can't get no satisfaction. And it doesn't matter how much you have, you still don't have enough. They asked old J.D. Rockefeller, how much does it take for someone to, to have enough? And he said, a little bit more. It doesn't matter how much you have, you, you just have to have a little bit more. That's greed. And, and you know, greed is not only the problem of the rich. You know, it, it can be the poor. It can be someone who's, you know, somewhere in between. It's not the amount of money or material possessions you have. It's how much that possesses you. Because if my drive is always to get more, I'll never be satisfied. I'll never be content. And as we're going to see, that runs the risk of great harm. If you have contentment, there's an inner sufficiency, even in spite of external circumstances. Paul says in another passage, I have learned the secret of being content when I've had a lot, when I've had a little. Again, it's not the amount that you have, it's the attitude that you have. And a lack of contentment can stifle godliness. But content people know that God is working on their behalf. It's it's a statement of faith that I believe God is going to provide even if I don't have much right now. Or I believe that what God has given me is good enough. Job said, and when he had lost it all, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. I'm sure... Paul was reflecting that sentiment when he's writing these words. We didn't bring anything into the world. We're not going to take anything out of it. You don't see a hearse pulling a U-Haul because you can't take it with you. you know, someone had made a remark at a, the funeral of a very wealthy person. How much did they leave behind? And the answer was, all of it. <laughs> and, and that's the truth. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 15, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. We leave it all behind. So why are we caught in the rat race of having to have more? We always have to have more. It's because we're not content with what we have. Paul defends his definition of contentment by accepting an undeniable truth. Everything material is fleeting. If you see it, it won't last. If you can touch it, if you can taste it, if you can hear it, if you can smell it, it's not going to last. So why get caught up in the accumulation of things. Now, material wealth does have value. You can do things with it. It helps sustain life. It can accomplish good while we're here on earth. Just remember, it's temporary. John Stott writes, possessions are only the traveling luggage of time. They're not the stuff of eternity. I like that. Possessions are only the traveling luggage of time. And (laughs) Well, when you go on a trip, you find out how luggage can be. And, you know, when you have to buy more bags to carry the stuff home, <clears throat> that's a little convicting. Uh, yeah. Stott goes on to say, it would be sensible, therefore, to travel light 
And as Jesus himself commanded us not to store up treasures on earth, to accumulate selfishly the stuff of earth. Too many of us know the price of everything but the value of nothing. We can be so glutted with luxuries, we've forgotten how to enjoy the necessities. Now, Paul says here, if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Does that mean that's all we're allowed to have? No. He's going to talk later in this very chapter about those who are wealthy. And he doesn't say, get rid of it all. He says, don't let it possess you. So he's not saying that you have to sell everything you have and and just barely get by and be happy about it. it. Again, it's not the amount that we have, it's the attitude we have about them. Later in this chapter, he says that God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So he's not saying that we have to live in poverty, but he's saying whatever circumstance you find yourself in, be content and know that God is the one who's providing for us. And then finally, verses 9 and 10, Paul warns against the ruin of greedy calamity. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul chooses his words very carefully here. He doesn't say those who are rich will fall into temptation and a trap. The Bible never condemns the wealthy for their abundance. He never calls money or wealth evil. Contentment has nothing to do with our circumstances in life. It has everything to do with our perspective on it. The fundamental question is not what do you have, but what do you want? We shouldn't ask how much will I get, but how much can I give? Because those who get into that grip of greed find that it leads to a lot of problems. King Solomon was one of the wealthiest the wealthiest man in the world at his time. And he said in Ecclesiastes 5.10, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. I mean, you can have it all and still want more because it does not satisfy. It doesn't bring contentment. There's always something out there that you don't have, something newer, something bigger, something faster, something better. And if the desire is driving us, we'll never have that contentment of heart. Without an eternal perspective, that earthly focus is just going to create more and more craving. You know, you can, you can be content, you can have peace with whatever you have, whatever God has given to you. you know, nowadays, it's difficult to decide which is more dangerous, the love of money in a materialistic society or the Christian's rationalization and joining in the chase. And remember, Paul is talking here not about the outside world, he's talking about within the church. This greed can worm its way in. And these false teachers can gain a following by people who get caught up into the, the, the greed of materialism. Jesus said, watch out. Be on guard against all forms of greed. One's life is not measured by their possessions. Boy, we need to hear that again today. You know, that old bumper sticker that said he who dies with the most toys wins really i like the other one that came out later it says he who dies with the most toys is still dead (laughs) he who dies with the most toys leaves them all behind i mean that's the truth and we need to be reminded of that verse 10 is 
maybe the most misquoted verse in all the Bible. It does not say money is the root of all evil. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's what Paul actually says. It isn't money. It's the love of money. It's the pursuit of it. It's the craving. It's that desire. I have to have more. That's what is a root of all kinds of evil, not just one kind. It, it can lead to so many things. The excessive desire to build wealth is a root that feeds an endless out outgrowth of evil. And the word order in the original language here puts the emphasis on the pronoun themselves. Their own unwise choices cause many sorrows, beginning with the decision to love the wrong objects. So really, in the end, they only have themselves to blame. You know, our fast-paced, consumer-oriented culture would have us believe that contentment is the cardinal sin of capitalism. Very few products are built to last because in just a couple years they're going to be obsolete, which keeps marketing gurus working overtime to convince us that we need the latest updates. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll take capitalism, uh, capitalism over socialism or communism or any other ism out there. I would much rather live in our society than in those other competing forms of economics. The problem is not on the supply side of the consumer equation, it's on the demand side. It's not up to Madison Avenue to tell us what will make us happy. That's our own responsibility. The truth is we will never find happiness in the acquisition of more, more, and more. Contentment is not something we find. Contentment is something we decide. It's a choice. It's an act of the will. It's not a feeling that comes and goes. It's a decision we make. So I want to encourage you to adopt three short statements and resolve to make them true. Number one, I'm grateful for what I have. Number two, I'm satisfied with what I earn. And number three, I'm generous to those in need. We're going to get to that one a little bit later in the chapter. But they all fit together. I'm grateful for what I have, I'm satisfied with what I earn, and I'm generous to those in need. That is the route to contentment. And that can help us resist the grip of greed because greed is not good. It leads to all kinds of evil and hurt. Godliness with contentment is good. And may that be the mark of our lives. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we... Admit we agree with the scripture that you are the source of all good things. Everything we enjoy ultimately comes from you. Even our ability to work, to earn a living, to acquire our necessities and even beyond our necessities, the things we enjoy, it all comes from you. But because of our sin, we forget that it comes from you we cease to give thanks to you and our our affection rather than going back to you where it belongs turns to the things we want to have and then possessions possess us father i pray that you would change our perspective, change our attitudes, help us to be content with what we have, to be generous with those in need, to be satisfied with what you give us. And may that be our testimony that will turn a lot of heads in a culture that's going the opposite direction. Help us to be those kinds of believers that bear a resemblance to you, our Heavenly Father. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.